let me make it very clear to everyone that this Bible, with the Christians believe to be the word of God, is not the Injil which we Muslims believe was revealed to Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. This Bible, according to us, it may contain the words of God, but it also contains words of prophets, words of historians. It contains absurdities, obscenity, as well as innumerable scientific errors. If there are scientific points mentioned in the Bible, there are possibilities, why not? It may be part of the word of God in the Bible, but what about the scientific errors? What about the unscientific portion? Can you attribute this to God? I want to make it very clear to my Christian brothers and sisters. The purpose of my presentation on Bible and science is not to hurt any Christian's feeling. If while presenting, if I hurt your feelings, I do apologize in advance. The purpose is only to point out that a God's revelation cannot contain scientific errors. As Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, search ye the truth, and the truth shall free you. You have the Old Testament, you have the New Testament. Now you should follow the last and final testament, which is the glorious Quran. As far as Dr. William Campbell is concerned, I can be more liberal with him because he has written a book, Quran, Bible in the Light of History and Science. He has given a presentation and he's a medical doctor. I don't have to be very formal with him. As far as the other Christian brothers and sisters are concerned, I apologize if I hurt your feelings during the presentation. Let's analyze what does the Bible say about modern science. First, we deal with astronomy. The Bible speaks about the creation of the universe. In the beginning, first book, book of Genesis, first chapter, it's mentioned. It says, Almighty God created the heavens and the earth in six days, and talks about an evening and a morning, referring to a 24-hour day. Today, scientists tell us that the universe cannot be created in a 24-hour period of six days. Quran 2 speaks about six Ayams, the Arabic word singular is yom, plural is ayam. It can either mean a day of 24 hours or it is a very long period, an yawn, an epoch. Scientists say we have no objection in agreeing that the universe, it could have been created in six very long period. Point number two, Bible says in Genesis chapter number one, verse three and five, light was created on first day. Genesis chapter one, verse 14 to 19, the cause of light, stars, and the sun, etc., was created on fourth day. How can the cause of light be created on the fourth day later than the light which came into existence on the first day? It's unscientific. Further, the Bible says, Genesis chapter 1, verse 9 to 13, earth was created on the third day. How can you have a night and day without the earth? The day depends upon the rotation of the earth. Without the earth created, how can you have a night and day? Point number four, Genesis chapter number one, verse nine to 13 says, earth was created on third day. Genesis chapter one, verse 14 to 19 says, the sun and the moon was created on the fourth day. Today, science tells us that earth is part of the parent body, the sun. It cannot come into existence before the sun. It's unscientific. Point number five, the Bible says in Genesis chapter number one, verse number 11 to 13, the vegetation, the herbs, the shrubs, the trees, they were created on the third day. And the sun, Genesis chapter number one, verse 14 to 19, was created on the fourth day. How can the vegetation come into existence without sunlight? And how can they survive without sunlight? <laughs> Point number six, that the Bible says in Genesis chapter one, verse number 16, that God created two lights. The greater light, the sun, to rule the day, and the lesser light, the moon, to rule the night. The actual translation, if you go to the Hebrew text, it is lamps. Lamps, having light of its own. And that you'll come to know better if you read both the verses, Genesis chapter one, verse 16 as well as 17. Verse number 17 says, and Almighty God placed them in the firmament to give light to the earth. 
to give light to the earth, indicating that sun and the moon have its own light, which is in contradiction with established scientific knowledge that we have. There are certain people who try and reconciliate and say that the six days mentioned in the Bible, it actually refers to epochs like the Quran, long period, not 624 days. It's illogical. You read the Bible, evening, morning, it clearly states 24 hours, it indicates. But even if I use a concordance approach, no problem. I agree with your illogical argument. Yet, they will only be able to solve the first scientific error of six days creation, and second, that first day light and third day earth. The remaining four, yet they cannot solve. Some further say that if it's a 24 period, why can't the vegetable survive for 124 day without sunlight? You say, fine. If you say that the vegetables were created before the sun and can survive for 124 day, I've got no objection. But you can't say the days mentioned are 24 hours as well as epochs. You can't have the cake and eat it both. If you say it is a long period, you solve point number one and three. The remaining four are yet there. If you say the days are 24 days, you solve only point number five. The remaining five are yet there. It becomes unscientific. I leave it to Dr. William Campbell, whether he wants to say it is long period and say that there are only four scientific errors, or say it is a 24 days and say there are only five scientific errors in the creation of the universe. In the field of zoology, it is mentioned in Leviticus chapter number 11, verse number 6, that hair is a cut chewer. We know that hair doesn't chew cut. Previously, people thought by the movement of the hair. Now we know hair is not a cut chewer, neither does it have a compartmentalized stomach. It's mentioned in the Proverbs chapter number 6, verse number 7, that ant has got no ruler, no seer, no chief. Today we know that ants are sophisticated insect. They have a very good system of labor in which they have chief, they have foreman, they have workers, they even have queen, they even have a ruler. Therefore, Bible is unscientific. Furthermore, it's mentioned in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, and Isaiah chapter 65, verse number 25, that serpents eat dust. No zoological book says serpents eat dust. It's mentioned in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 11, verse number 20, among the abomination things, fowls with four feet. They are an abomination. And some scholars say that fowl is the wrong translation of the Hebrew word oof in King James. It should be insect or winged creature. And in New International Version, it says winged creature. But it says all insects which are four-footed are an abomination. They are detestable for you. I want to ask Dr. William Campbell, which insects have got four feet? Even a student who has passed elementary school knows that insects have got six feet. There is no bird in the world. There is no fowl in the world. There is no insect in the world which has got four feet. Furthermore, there are mythical animals and fabulous animals mentioned in the Bible as though they exist. For example, unicorn. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter 34, verse number 7, talking about unicorn. As though it exists, you look up in the dictionary, it says the animal which has got a horse's body and a horn, which is only available in myths regarding the concept of earth. There are various scientists who have described how will the world end. Hypothesis. Some may be right, some may be wrong. But either the world will perish or the world will live forever. Both cannot take place simultaneously. It's unscientific. But this is exactly what the Bible says. It's mentioned in the Bible. In the book of Hebrews, chapter number 1, verse number 10 and 11, and in the book of Psalms, chapter number 102, verse number 25 and 26, that Almighty God created the heavens and the earth, and they will perish. Exactly opposite is mentioned in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter number 1, verse number 4, and the book of Psalms, chapter number 78, verse number 69, that the earth will abide forever. I leave it to Dr. William Campbell to choose which of the two verses are unscientific. The first pair or the second pair? One has to be unscientific. Both cannot take place. The world cannot abide forever as well as perish. It's unscientific. Regarding the heavens, the Bible says in Job chapter 26, verse 11, that the pillars of the heaven will tremble. Quran says in Surah Luqman chapter 31, verse number 10, that the heavens are without any pillars. Don't you see it? Don't you see the heavens are without any pillars? Bible says heaven has got pillars. Not only do the heavens have got pillars, Bible says in the first book of Samuel, 
chapter number 2, verse number 8, as well as the book of Job, chapter number 9, verse number 6, and the book of Psalms, chapter number 75, verse number 3, that even the earth have got pillars. In the field of diet and nutrition, let's analyze what does the Bible say. The Bible says in the book of Genesis, chapter number 1, verse number 29, that God has given you all the herbs bearing seeds, the trees bearing fruits, those that bear seed, as meat for you. New International Version says, the seed bearing plant and the trees bearing fruits, bearing seeds, are food for you, all of them. Today, even a layman knows that there are several poisonous plants, like wild berries, strychnine, datura, plants containing alkaloid, oleander, buckeipoid, that which if you ingest, if you eat, there are high possibilities you may die. How come the creator of the universe and human beings doesn't know that if you have these plants, you will die? I hope Dr. William Campbell doesn't give this vegetarian diet to his patients. <laughs> the Bible has a scientific test how to identify a true believer. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 16, verse number 17 and 18. It says that there will be signs for true believers, and among the signs, in my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak foreign tongues, new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink deadly poison, they shall not be harmed. And when they place their hand over the sick, they shall be cured. This is a scientific test. In scientific terminology, it's known as the confirmatory test for a true Christian believer. In the past 10 years of my life, I have personally interacted with thousands of Christians, including missionary. I have not come across a single Christian who has passed this confirmatory test of the Bible. I have not come across a single Christian who took poison. I have not come across any who took poison and who has not died. And in scientific terminology, this is also called as a falsification test. That means if a false person tries and does this test, takes poison, he will die. And a false person will not dare attempt this test. If you are not a true Christian believer, you will not dare attempt this test. Because if you try and attempt the falsification test, you will fail. So. A person who is not a true Christian believer will never attempt this test. I have read the book, the Quran, the Bible in the light of history and science, written by Dr. William Campbell. And I assume that he is a true Christian believer. And at least I would like <laughs> him to confirm to me about the falsification test. Please be rest assured. Please be rest assured. I will not ask Dr. William Campbell to have deadly poison because I don't want to jeopardize the debate. <laughs> what I'll do, I will only ask him to speak in foreign tongues, in new languages. And as many of you may be aware, that India is a land which has more than 1,000 languages and dialects. Only thing I request him is to say these three words, 100 rupees, in the 17 official languages. There are only 17 official languages in India. And to make it easier for Dr. William Campbell, I've got a 100 rupee note. And this has all the 17 languages mentioned here. Besides English and Hindi, I will help him. I'll give him a beginning. Ekso rupia in Hindi. <laughs> the remaining 15 languages are here. I'll request him to read. I know the test says they will speak foreign languages on their own, without the help of reading. But I want to make the test easier. I want to see someone passing the test. I have not seen anyone. <laughs> so if he can't say it on his own or from his memory, at least read it. I don't mind. I will accept it. And I request the chairperson to give it to Dr. William Campbell. <laughs> he has his rebuttal. 15 languages, ek so rupiah, three words only. What does the Bible say 
regarding hydrology. Bible says in Genesis, chapter number 9, verse number 13 to 17, that after God, at the time of Noah, submerged the world by flood, and after the flood subsides, he said, I put up a rainbow in the sky as a promise to the humankind never to submerge the world again by water. To the unscientific person, it may be quite good. Oh, rainbow is a sign of Almighty God, never to submerge the world by flood again. But today we know very well that rainbow is due to the refraction of sunlight with rain or mist. Surely there may have been thousands of rainbows before the time of Noah, peace be upon him. To say it was not there before Noah's time, you have to assume that the law of refraction did not exist, which is unscientific. In the field of medicine, the Bible says, in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 14, verse number 14 and 53, it gives a novel way for disinfecting a house from a plague of leprosy. Disinfecting a house from a plague of leprosy. It says that take two birds, kill one bird, take wood, scarlet, hyssop, and the other living bird, dip it in water, and under running water, later on, sprinkle the house seven times with it. Sprinkle the house with blood to disinfect against plague of leprosy? We know blood is a good media of germ, bacteria, as well as toxin. I hope Dr. William Campbell doesn't use this method of disinfecting the OT, the operation theater. It's mentioned in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 12, verse number 1 to 5. And we know medically that after a mother gives birth to a child, the postpartum period, it is unhygienic. To say it's unclean religiously, I've got no objection. But Leviticus chapter number 12, verse number 1 to 5 says that after a woman gives birth to a male child, she will be unclean for seven days. And the period of uncleanliness will continue for 33 days more. If she gives birth to a female child, she'll be unclean for two weeks, and the period of uncleanliness will continue for 66 days. In short, if a woman gives birth to a male child, a son, she is unclean for 40 days. If she gives birth to a female child, a daughter, she is unclean for 80 days. I would like Dr. William Campbell to explain to me scientifically how come a woman remain unclean for double the period if she gives birth to a female child as compared to a male child. <laughs> the Bible also has a very good test for adultery. How to come to know a woman has committed adultery. In book of Numbers, chapter number 5, verse number 11 to 31. I'll just say in brief, it says that the priest should take holy water in a vessel, take dust from the floor, and put it into the vessel. And that's the bitter water. And after cursing it, give it to the woman. And if the woman has committed adultery, after she drinks it, the curse will enter her body, the stomach will swell, the thigh will rot, and she shall be cursed by the people. If the woman has not committed adultery, she will remain clean, and she will bear the seed. A novel method of identifying whether a woman has committed adultery or not. You know, today in the world, there are thousands of cases pending in different parts of the world, in different courts of law, only on the assumption that someone has alleged that the woman has committed adultery. I had read in the newspapers, and I came to know from the media that the president of this great country, Mr. Bill Clinton, he was involved in a sex scandal about two years back. I wonder that why didn't the American court use this bitter water test for adultery? He would have gone scot-free immediately. <laughs> why didn't the Christian missionaries of this great country especially those who are in the medical field, like my respected Dr. William Campbell, use this bitter water test to bail out their president immediately. Mathematics is a branch which is closely associated with science, with which you can solve problems, etc. There are thousands of contradictions in the Bible. Hundreds deal with mathematics. I'll just touch on a few of them. It's mentioned in Ezra chapter number 2, Verse number one. And Nehemiah chapter number seven, verse number six, the context, that when the people returned from exile from Babylon, when King Nebuchadnezzar 
of Babylon, when he released the men from Israel, they came back from captivity, and the list of the people are given. The list is given in Ezra, chapter number 2, verse number 2 to 63, and Nehemiah chapter number 7, verse number 7 up to 65. The list is given with the names, as well as number of people released. In these 60 verses, there are no less than 18 times the name is exactly the same, but the number is different. There are no less than 18 contradictions in less than 60 verses of these two chapters. This is the list. I don't have time to run through the list. There are no less than 18 different contradictions in less than 60 verses. Further, it's mentioned in Ezra, chapter number 2, verse number 64, that the total congregation, if you add up, if you add up, it comes to 42,360. And if you read in Nehemiah, chapter number 7, verse number 66, there also the total is the same, 42,360. But if you add up all these verses, which I had to do my homework, this is a list. This is a list of Ezra. This is a list of Nehemiah. Ezra chapter number two, Nehemiah chapter number seven. If you add up, I have to do my homework. If you add up in Ezra chapter number two, it doesn't come to 42,360, it comes to 29,818. And if you add up Nehemiah chapter number seven, even there it doesn't come to 42,360, it comes to 31,089. The author of the Bible, presumed to be almighty God, does not know simple addition. If you give this problem even to a person who passed elementary school, he'll be able to get the right answer. If you add up all the 60 verses, it's so easy. Almighty God didn't know adding knows Billah if we presume that this is the word of God. Further, if we read in Ezra chapter number 2, verse number 65, it says there were 200 singing men and women. Nehemiah chapter number 7, verse 67, there were 245 singing men and women. Were they 200 or were they 245 singing men and women? Context is the same, a mathematical contradiction. It's mentioned in the second Kings, chapter number 24, verse number 8, that Joachim was 18 years old when he began to reign Jerusalem. And he reigned for three months. Second Chronicles, chapter number 36, verse number 9 says that Joachim was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for three months, 10 days. Was Joachim 18 years when he began to reign, or was he eight years old? Did he reign for three months, or did he reign for three months, 10 days? Further, it's mentioned in the first Kings. Chapter number seven, verse number 26, that in Solomon's temple in his molten sea, he had 2,000 baths. In Second Chronicles, chapter number four, verse number five, he had 3,000 baths. Did he have 2,000 baths or did he have 3,000 baths? That I leave it upon Dr. William Campbell to decide, which is correct. There is a clear cut mathematical contradiction. It's mentioned in the first Kings, chapter number 15, verse number 33, that Basha, he died in the 26th year of reign of Asa. And Second Chronicles, chapter number 16, verse number one says that Basha invaded Judah in the 36th year of the reign of Asa. How can Basha invade 10 years after his death? It's unscientific.